The U.S. Naval War College is a Navy's home of thought. Established in 1884, NWC has become the center of naval sea power both strategically and intellectually. The following Issues in National Security lecture is specifically designed to offer scholarly lectures to all participants. We hope you enjoy this upcoming discussion and future lectures. Well, good afternoon and welcome to our eighth Issues in National Security lecture held in the virtual world. I am Commander Gary Ross and I'll serve as your host for today's event. To kick us off, as usual, I'd like to turn it over to Rear Admiral Shoshana Chatfield, President of the Naval War College, to offer her greetings. Admiral? Hello. Um, it is so nice to be here. Uh, this is my husband, David Scovel, most of you know already. Uh, and we are fans of and the biggest supporters of this Issues in National Security uh, lecture series. We are so fortunate to see the roles swap this evening and to see um, our normal MC become our uh, lecturer and to see Gary Ross uh, step in and take over the MC role. So they're very special for us uh, to hear more from Professor Jackson today. Um, I encourage you to stick around uh, for our family group and uh, David has uh, just a little bit to say about uh, what we can expect uh, just after the lecture. Yeah, I thought uh, I'm glad John's doing the, uh, the, the speaking on the drones and not Gary and Gary's doing the hosting in, in, in this case, not John. But uh, other than that, uh, we do have some uh, people joining us for the benefits, uh, our benefits partners joining us for the uh, family discussion group. Uh, a nice uh, group of uh, folks are going to jump in and uh, tell us what they do and uh, what uh, what their services provide us with. Uh, most of you are familiar with uh, Eugenie Genero from, uh, sorry, just come on. Hello, Eugenie, um, from Humana. And as we're coming to the end of the uh, open enrollment, she's just once again <laughs> coming back to remind us. We've had her on a few times now. So uh, this is just one more reminder for those people like me who procrastinate and uh, still need to get their uh, health benefits done. And then we also have, uh, following her is Jennifer Hamill, our exceptional family member uh, program representative. And I believe her regional uh, person is with her as well. And uh, lastly, we're gonna take, we're gonna try to uh, hone in on the uh, Marine Corps and see what they're doing during the uh, Toys for Tots toy drive at the end of this. And we have, uh, a couple of gentlemen from the Marine Corps. I think it's uh, First Admiral, I'm sorry, yeah, First, First Sergeant uh, Marshall Cleveland and perhaps uh, Corporal Richard Jones might be on board with us. I have not seen them yet, but we hope to check in on them and see how they're doing. So uh, as usual, we hope to uh, get some questions for each of our benefits partners from our spouses and participate in the dialogue. And of course, tell the guys with the Marine Corps what a great job they're doing. We think it's a wonderful cause. So. There you go, that's what we've got. Back over to you, Gary Ross. All right, thank you very much, Admiral and uh, David. Uh, for anyone just jo joining us, I want to reiterate that this series was originally conceived as a way to share a portion of the Naval War College's academic experience with the spouses and significant others of our student body. Over the past four years, it has been restructured to include participation by the entire Naval War College extended family, to include members of the Naval War College Foundation, international sponsors, civilian employees, and colleagues throughout Naval Station Newport. We will be offering 10 additional lectures between now and May 2021, spaced about two weeks apart. An announcement uh, will be uh, detailing the dates, topics, and speakers of each lecture will be posted uh, by me uh, or my public affairs office. Um, on uh, Tuesday, 12 January, our first lecture of the new year, we will feature an engaging discussion on national security and space with Professor David Burbach. Each event will consist of three parts, the scholarly speaker's presentation, a question and answer period, and then a brief pause before we proceed to the family discussion session. The final segment is of primary interest to family members residing here in Newport, and it will feature guest speakers as the Admiral and David have already mentioned. Uh, um, Eugenia from Humana will be speaking, Jennifer uh, will be talking about the exceptional family member program, and um, as David mentioned, First Sergeant Marshall Cleveland will talk to us briefly about Toys for Tots, a very important program uh, for this time of season. 
And if you didn't see my email earlier today, to today's lecture is a special holiday ed edition. All participants are highly encouraged to show their holiday spirit and wear their favorite holiday sweater. So I hope that you've you, you've uh, put it on to, tonight and are, are willing to show us. Participants will vote for their favorite sweater and favorite ugly sweater uh, and be nice in the comments section as well. Winners will receive a $10 Starbucks gift card. So uh, votes will be taken in the chat window and you can vote uh, once in each category. Uh, if you would like to participate, please turn on your video camera. Winners will be announced at the next lecture on January 12th. Good luck and have fun. Okay, on with the main event. Please feel free to ask questions using the chat feature at the bottom of uh, your Zoom window, and we will address them at the conclusion of the presentation. I am very pleased to introduce our speaker, Professor John Jackson. Professor, Professor Jackson will discuss the, the past, present, and future uses of robotic and unmanned systems, both in the military services and in private use. Known by many as the Duke of Drones, he will draw from his recent book, one Nation Under Drones, to address everything you always wanted to know about drones, but were afraid to ask. John Jackson is a professor in the Naval War College's College of Distance Education. He teaches in the area of national security affairs and also serves as the program manager for the Chief of Naval Operations Professional Reading Program. And here's a tipper, that, uh, that uh, professional reading program is about to be updated. So you will be seeing uh, more official uh, 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 information about that uh, program coming out of the Pentagon here shortly. Uh, a longtime proponent of emerging uh, technology, he has co-moderated one of the college's most popular elective courses entitled Unmanned Systems and Conflict in the 21st Century since the 2009 academic year. In March of 2010, he was called to testify before the U.S. House of Representatives Subcommittee on National Security regarding this course and the attitude of military officers towards evolving technology. In October 2017, he was appointed as the EA Sperry Chair of Robotics and Unmanned Systems. He retired from active duty service in the U.S. Navy at the rank of captain after 27 years of service in the logistics and graduate education fields. He has been listed in Marquis who in America since 1997. So I am pleased to pass the digital baton to my friend and colleague, Professor John Jackson. Uh, over to you, uh, John. Thank you very much, uh, Gary. Uh, I apologize for that uh, lengthy introduction, but then again, I wrote it, so I guess I shouldn't apologize too much. So it, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, this evening on the other side of the uh, platform, and we'll spend a little time talking about my favorite subject, which is robots and unmanned systems. Uh, over my shoulder here, I have Robbie the robot from the... Uh, famous movie, Forbidden Planet. So he will, uh, I'm sure, join in periodically. So uh, let me see if we can share our screen and we'll get started. Okay, are we coming through loud and clear, Gary? Okay. All right. Well, what well, would like uh, John? Say again. Loud and clear, John. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Well, what we're going to do is talk about robots that fly, swim, and crawl. It's a subject that uh, you can hardly pick up a magazine or a newspaper and not see something written about that subject. Thanks, Dean. Uh, next slide, please. As I said, uh, you can't pick up a magazine or newspaper without finding something to do with uh, drones and uh, the way they're being used both in military and in civilian applications. Next slide. The question is, is this a new idea? Well, like most things we find uh, in the world, not really. Uh, next slide. This is the Sperry Automatic Airplane, uh, which was developed in 1918. And what's interesting here is this is a uh, unmanned aircraft and the uh, process was to load it full of uh, bombs and uh, explosives, point it in generally towards the target. It would take off, it would count the number of times the propeller goes around and when it got to a certain number, it would cut off the engine and it would dive on the target. 
not exactly precision guided munitions, but uh, it was used successfully, not in war because by 1918 we were, uh, we were out of the business, but it was the first opportunity, next slide, to, uh, to have a system. And in these days, uh, you know, it was, it was very difficult to get any airplane in the air for any substantial amount of time and to be able to do it as a robotic uh, aircraft with no one in the uh, cockpit is pretty significant. So we jump ahead to uh, World War II, next session, next slide. And this is the, uh, the radio plane Denny Mike. Uh, Reginald Denny, who was a movie star back in that period, was also an advocate of radio controlled aircraft. And he said, you know, I think these things could probably be used for more than just uh, playing around in the backyard. So what normally happens is uh, if you're gonna be a cannoneer, you're gonna be a naval gunner, you have to practice what you do. So many times they would take a manned airplane, tow a target behind it and ask the, uh, the cannoneers to fire at the target, not at the airplane. Didn't always happen that way. So uh, they said, maybe we could do something on an unmanned basis. And so that's what they did with the Denny Mike. And they built over 7,000 of these during the Second World War and were used as targets and to tow targets and were very, very successful. Next slide. So the, uh, the uh, company that was building these uh, had a young woman helping to assemble the drones. They sent a and took a picture of her at work and the photographer said, you know, that's a pretty attractive young woman. I wonder uh, uh, if she could do something other than build drones. Next slide. And that turned out to be Marilyn Monroe. So uh, this is the uh, kind of ultimate uh, bar bet. Uh, how did Marilyn Monroe get her start? And the answer is uh, building drones. So uh, next slide. We hear Lady Gaga is interested in getting into the drone business, and if that's the case, I think I'm going to get out of the drone business. So uh, next slide, please. We're going to take a look at uh, aerial systems, maritime systems, and ground systems. And on the aerial systems, we'll start with the largest and then look down towards the smaller. We'll also look at rotary wing and look at swarming uh, uh, systems. So next slide. This is probably the most uh, famous, uh, largest uh, drone that's being flown. This is the RQ-4 Global Hawk flown by the uh, US Air Force. It's strictly a surveillance platform. No weapons are carried, but it is able to fly for up to 30 hours at a time. In effect, it could take off from California, fly to Maine, observe what's going on there, and then fly back home. So it's been a, a very, very successful reconnaissance platform. In fact, next slide, the uh, Navy looked and said, you know what, we have an awful lot of ocean area that we need to surveil. So perhaps we should have a version of the Global Hawk. And so Navy has developed the Triton, the MQ-4C Triton. It's shown flying over a carrier. It does not land on a carrier, cannot take off from a carrier. It is a uh, shore-based aircraft. Next slide. Give you an idea of the size, this is, uh, uh, yours truly standing by one of the Triton vehicles uh, being flown by uh, VUP-19, which is the unmanned uh, uh, squadron operated in Point Magoo, California and other locations. And it gives you an idea of uh, how big the systems are. Now, when I'm doing this live, it's pretty obvious, but I want to let you know that uh, I stand about six foot six. So if you'd play the next uh, slide, please. Uh, this gives you an idea. Here's me and uh, one of my fellow uh, Naval War College professors. That's Professor uh, Tyrion uh, Lannister from Game of Thrones. But next slide. Clearly, I'm six foot six. So uh, when you see all these drones, you'll know uh, exactly how big they are. Next slide, please. This is the MQ-4 Reaper. Uh, they, uh, the Air Force started out with the Predator, and this is the larger version of the Reaper. This you've heard an awful lot about, I'm sure. It's able to carry uh, bombs, missiles, Hellfire missiles, as you see here, and to do armed reconnaissance. Again, it can fly for up to 24 hours. And the uh, aircraft is operated by pilots operating in the United States. So the aircraft is in the theater of operations, but the pilot uh, is actually somewhere in the United States. Next slide. This is a uh, photo from uh, the control center at uh, Creech Air Force Base in Nevada. 
and they have a hole in the ground that the visiting Navy guys stand in so the Air Force guys look taller. But anyway, this is a, a full-size version of the uh, of the Predator Reaper that you can see standing there in the uh, in the overhead. So next slide, please. The Navy, again, was looking at, could we operate unmanned air systems from our carriers? So while we have the Triton, which operates from shore, we've developed a, uh, a uh, craft that could take off and land from an aircraft carrier. Next slide, please. This is an indicator of how big that aircraft is. So you see it's about an F-18 uh, aircraft size drone. So these things are certainly not small nor are they uh, uh, toys of any sort. Next slide, please. The uh, challenging, one of the more challenging things that naval aviators are asked to do is to do air-to-air -air refueling. Uh, this is a photo of an unmanned aircraft behind taking fuel from a manned tanker in the front. Uh, this was part of the developmental program and the Navy was able to demonstrate the ability to do that. And so, as always, when you have air-to-air -air refueling, you significantly enhance the, uh, the uh, distance and endurance that you can operate your aircraft. Next slide. The MQ-25 Alpha is the uh, follow-on to the UKS, which I previously showed you. This is the program that is going to develop a air-to-air -air refueler. So when you saw the previous uh, slide, it was an unmanned aircraft taking fuel. This will be an unmanned aircraft which delivers fuel. It'll launch from the aircraft carrier, go out, refuel the fighters and attack aircraft as they're going out to their targets and as they return uh, uh, back. So this is a uh, program. Boeing is the uh, primary uh, uh, builder of this aircraft. They've flown a prototype and they'll be flying additional ones here in the near future with the hope that we get uh, actual aircraft on the aircraft carriers by about uh, 2024 if, uh, if we can make that schedule. So next slide, please. This is uh, very briefly, this is the RQ-170 Sentinel and this is a stealth version of a drone. It's significantly smaller than the uh, the UKS and the uh, M25 Alpha Stingray, but this is a uh, aircraft that uh, has flown extensively in uh, high security situations. And if you remember the uh, video of the uh, Bin Laden takedown, this aircraft was flying overhead, providing uh, overhead imagery. So that's the RQ-170. Uh, rumor has it there, there is a follow-on aircraft that has uh, been developed, but uh, we stay at the unclassifiable. But obviously, if you have the ability to use a drone, it's stealthy. That's something that could provide uh, a great benefit to our, our services. Next slide. So we'll go down a little bit smaller. This is the uh, U.S. Marine Corps Blackjack. Uh, next slide, please. And this gives you an indication of the size of the aircraft and it will launch from either at sea or it will launch from ashore and will say a surveillance to the Marine forces, the ground forces. Uh, and as always, you're interested in knowing what's on the other side of that hill that you particularly potentially are gonna to have to cross. And so these aircrafts provide uh, great visibility for those situations. So. The, uh, the Blackjack has been uh, fielded and the Marines are having uh, significant success with that platform. Next slide. We go uh, a little bit smaller. This is the switchblade. And you can see on the right hand side of this photo, it's the operator who's looking in the uh, control console and is flying this uh, aircraft. It launches from that tube with compressed air and goes up and flies for about 25 minutes at a time. Now, what's interesting with the switchblade is that it has a warhead in the front of it. And so it is really a loitering munition and it will fly and uh, for about 25 minutes. And when you launch it, it is going to detonate. So 
if you do not locate a target that you desire to strike, then you will fly that into a hillside, but you don't want that one coming back. <laughs> it's not something you want to see coming over the horizon and where it was launched. But uh, Switchblade is a uh, very successful special radium forces and uh, ground uh, forces. Next slide, please. This is a version of the uh, the uh, aircraft that's known as Blackwing, and it's designed to launch from submarines, and it will fly to the surface, take off, fly for about 25 minutes, and send badges of what it sees. So, in effect, it gives a mariner a four to five hundred foot tall periscope and visibility of what's going on around the submarine. And there's no attempt to recover that aircraft. Otherwise, they are relatively inexpensive. And so once they've completed their mission, they will, uh, will crash at sea. Next slide. <clears throat> There's a lot of discussion these days of uh, loyal wingmen. This is a, known as an attritable aircraft. And the notion here is what if you had an F-35 fighter or an F-22 fighter, whatever the case might be, attack aircraft and you wanted to have additional weapons, if you wanted to have a uh, wingman who could fly potentially further inland and strike the target, this would be a way to do it. So significant money is being spent to develop this attritable aircraft. And the notion is that the uh, pilot in control of the manned aircraft would control three, four or five of these flying in formation with them and significantly expand the uh, capabilities of those individual aircraft. Next slide. A fascinating program. This is called Gremlins. And the uh, question here is if you have the ability to carry a number of these aircraft in a cargo aircraft, as you can see in the background, launch these uh, UAVs on manned aerial vehicles. They will fly out, fly out and do the surveillance mission that you've asked them to do. Then they come back and they'll be recovered in flight by the cargo aircraft. You'll bring it back, refuel it, and take them back out and use them again. So it's really a remarkable capability. And to be able to think that you can launch and then recover aircraft in flight is a significant capability. Uh, the design work is underway. The uh, Gremlin aircraft have flown, and they've done uh, you know, tentative uh, lock-ons to recover them and winch them back into the aircraft. So. This will be a, a great capability once it's developed. Next slide. The issue of swarms is one that's uh, of great concern. Uh, a ship can defend itself from uh, incoming aircraft. It can defend itself against incoming uh, missiles. Can it defend against uh, tens, dozen, hundreds of swarming UAVs, and that's a significant challenge to be able to do that. Uh, you've probably all seen swarms of uh, unmanned aerial vehicles flying over the Olympics, flying over uh, uh, various stadiums and whatnot. So the capability exists to fly large quantities of these aircraft. If they were able to uh, be militarized, it could be a significant challenge for us. So we are uh, working hard on how to deal with the uh, swarms of unmanned aerial vehicles. Next slide, please. We'll switch here to rotary wing drones. Uh, the, this is a, a design that I certainly would not want to take on myself. Uh, it looks like a flying egg beater, if you will, but uh, uh, there's so many different approaches to how these uh, uh, rotary wing aircraft might work. And this is just, one example of uh, a multi-multi-rotor aircraft. Next slide. Next slide, please. This is the MQ-8C Fire Scout. This is an unmanned helicopter. It's a uh, converted Bell 407 helicopter, which has been converted to fly totally unmanned. There'll be an operator somewhere nearby that's operating this aircraft. It can fly surveillance missions primarily although efforts have been uh, developed to carry weapons in some circumstances. Next slide, please. And again, this is an indicator of the size of the aircraft. This happens to be a smaller version of the Fire Scout uh, 
And once again, that's uh, that's the uh, the standing uh, ruler, if you will. Uh, you'll note I'm wearing a blue shirt. Uh, I took a bunch of these photos at a conference I went to. My boss said, oh, we sent you to a five-day conference. You spent one day going around and taking pictures, and you spent the rest of the time on a golf course. Well, number one, I don't golf, and number two, I uh, learned a lesson that says change your shirt between photos or you're going to get yourself in trouble. So next slide, please. So this is the Ray uh, Lockheed k -Mat, and this is a fascinating aircraft that uh, it weighs 6,000 pounds and it can carry 6,000 pounds. It carries cargo slung beneath the aircraft. Marines took this to uh, uh, Afghanistan and had uh, significant success. The notion is that if you're going to supply a uh, outpost, you'll have to send in trucks with materials. The trucks can be attacked with IEDs and with other uh, weapons. What if you didn't have to send the trucks at all? What if you could take the material and fly it directly into your forward operating base? And that's what the KMAX uh, was intended to do and did very successfully and moved seven million, several million pounds of cargo during its test period. So the question now is, uh, will the Marines, will the Army continue to develop unmanned helicopters? They are doing the design work now, and we'll see if they uh, wind up in the inventory uh, in the near future. Next slide. We go down even smaller, and this is the Instant Eye quad rotor. It's got four, four rotors, the bus versus why we say quad rotor. Uh, this is known as the quads for squads, and the Marines will be equipped, each squad will be equipped with their own drone that they can throw into the air and fly over the hill and see what's going on before they have to deal with it. So you can see the one troop launching the aircraft and the operator there to his right. So uh, huge numbers of these are being procured, and again, the Marines have been really on the leading edge of using unmanned systems for a number of different applications. Next slide. This is the Black Hornet, which is a nano drone. And this is really the smallest militarized drone that's being used. You can see the size of it there in that trooper's fingers. Uh, it's designed for surveillance. You throw it in the air, it'll send back a video of what it sees for 10 to 12 minutes at a time. You recover it and recharge it and you can launch it again. So a uh, very unique uh, device is being used by uh, US forces, allied forces and a number of people around the world. So looks like a toy, but it is not a toy. It does success, uh, successful work and uh, saves lives. So next slide. On the civilian side, there's been a lot of talk about reusing rotary wing craft. Uh, this is a design for a uh, unmanned aerial vehicle taxi uh, developed by a Chinese company. And the theory here is that you get into this uh, machine, you touch the iPad to tell it where you wanna go, take me to Tiverton. Uh, it takes off, no pilot, no parachute, just one terrified passenger. So it's a interesting approach and we'll see if uh, that comes to pass. But uh, next slide, please. This is another version. This is called the Volocopter. And this is uh, uh, yours truly in, uh, in Singapore looking at this device. Uh, people like uh, Uber and Lyft and others are very, very interested in using unmanned aerial vehicles to carry passengers within the United States and all around the world. So. If in fact they can develop the ability to use these, you can see them landing on top of a building in downtown Los Angeles and flying you out to wherever you wanna go, dropping you off and either picks up a passenger and comes back or comes back empty and is ready to fly again. So uh, watch this space. Uh, you'll see a lot going on in, the, in this area. Next slide. Rotary craft, uh, there's, there's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of uh, toys being used. This is a uh, unmanned uh, aircraft that uh, was flown onto the lawn of the White House back in January of 2015. You may have remembered this. It was uh, 
it was New Year's Eve and somebody decided to take their Christmas gift and see if they could fly it into the White House. Uh, and so it made an awful lot of people nervous because these are very, very difficult to defend against because they're so small. They don't have much of a radar, radar signature. And so there's a lot of question as to how we would deal with such uh, vehicles. So here comes the best, best photo of the presentation, I believe. Next slide, please. This is what I call my John Wayne picture. Uh, this is the Skywall. And so it's a counter unmanned aerial system device. And what you do is you look through the uh, viewfinder and you follow the quad rotor, whatever it is that's coming towards you. When it goes beep, 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 you press the trigger it launches a projectile which flies out and dispenses a net and catches the drone and brings it back to earth. It can put out a parachute and float it back gently to earth or it can just let it crash. Either way, you've got the ability hopefully to go to it and do some forensics and see if in fact you can determine where this aircraft came from or learn how you can prevent them on another occasion from attacking. Uh, as you can see, we're on the front lawn in front of the uh, front of the War College, and uh, we shot down four or five drones that day, and it was uh, it was it was a highlight. Uh, next slide. This is another uh, counter UAS. This is called the Drone Killer, and the uh, issue here is it does not use a kinetic device to knock the drone down. It uses an electronic signal to jam the uh, operator, to jam the drone so that it cannot execute its mission. One of the problems with this approach is it also tends, tends to jam other nearby radios and communication systems and whatnot. So it's uh, usable in a combat environment, not necessarily in a civilian application. The uh, previous one, Skywall, that we showed conceivably could be used outside a football arena or anywhere else that the people are gathering and uh, use it in a civilian context, but for defense of that facility. Next slide. And this interestingly enough is they've actually trained hawks to attack unmanned aerial vehicles uh, and fly up there and knock them out of the sky. Uh, when this was first developed, there was concern from the uh, SPCA and others that the Hawks were gonna injure their talons. They actually developed little bitty uh, gloves, Kevlar gloves, so go up and attack the uh, drones and take them out of the sky. So lots of ideas. Anybody that's got a good idea as to how you can counter these things should, uh, should bring that forward because it's a, uh, it's a growth market. Okay, next slide, please. So we've talked mostly about aviation so far. Let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, maritime systems. This is a uh, artist conception. It's a uh, illustration of the uh, the Sea Hunter, which uh, now exists. It is an unmanned surface vehicle, about 131 feet in length, and it's designed to either track submarines underwater or to be applied to various other tasks. Uh, sea Hunter. Uh, some months back, sailed from San Diego to Hawaii and back with no one on board. It understands the rules of the road. It will avoid collisions. It's a remarkable platform. The uh, company, uh, uh, Lidos, is the uh, builder, and they have been uh, hired by the U.S. Navy to build a second version of the Sea Hunter, and they will both be used in experimental capability to see how the U.S. Navy could use such vehicles on the surface. Next slide. And we don't know. There's a whole family of uh, unmanned surface vehicles in development. This is uh, just artist conceptions of medium unmanned surface ve vehicles. Next slide. And this is a uh, maritime system. This is a un unmanned, un I'm having a terrible day unmanned undersea vehicle, and they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. Next, please. So this is a little out of sequence. Uh, this is the surface platform, and this is uh, potential uses for an unmanned automated surface vessel. Uh, the picture on the bottom could theoretically be a 
arsenal ship. It could have hundreds of missiles in the, uh, in the ship controlled by a manned vehicle somewhere else. And so it would significantly expand the, uh, the, our, the capabilities of those surface ships to fly, fire uh, missiles on various targets. Next slide. We briefly mentioned unmanned undersea vehicles. This is a very uh, busy uh, uh, slide and just suffice to say at the bottom, we talk about small man portable vehicles. We go into the medium size, into large and then to extra large vehicles. All of these have capabilities in various uh, uh, applications. Next slide, please. Some of them, as we indicate, are uh, able to be launched by one individual. Uh, at the top are a bunch of sea gliders, which can actually go out for six to nine months at a time and uh, basically travel with the currents and send back the information on temperature, uh, salinity, and all the factors that uh, submariners are particularly interested in, in terms of uh, anti-submarine warfare. And then the bigger ones, as you see there, are launched by ships and uh, a little, little, the larger they are, obviously, the more capable and the longer range that they have. Next slide. This is uh, one of the more interesting ones. This is the Echo Voyager, uh, which was built by Boeing uh, for the ORCA program. And the notion here is, can you have an unmanned submarine that's large enough to do missions of up to six months at a time to carry weapons, to carry whatever you want in a huge cargo area. The vehicle is 81 feet long. It has a 34 foot payload section. It can drop mines from the bottom. It could launch UAVs or missiles from the top. It could even launch SEALs, Navy SEALs in shallow water against targets ashore. Next slide. And this is uh, the launch uh, of the vehicle out at the Boeing facility. And uh, as you can see, I'm there. Uh, again, I always like to have a blue shirt. So next slide. There you go. So <laughs> I always like to have my blue shirt wherever I go. Uh, Boeing is, has been contracted to build uh, five of these vehicles and they will be turned over to the Navy uh, within the next uh, 18 to 24 months to start developmental work on exactly how they can be used in uh, various applications. Next slide, please. And this is uh, ashore. Uh, this is the size of that payload uh, area. So as you can see, it, it's, it's really huge and gives you the flexibility to do uh, many different things with this, uh, with this uh, unmanned submarine. Next slide, please. Okay, let's switch away from maritime to ground and we'll go pretty quickly on that so we leave some time for questions. Next slide. This is uh, the PackBot, which is a uh, explosive, ex I am having a terrible day. This is a uh, uh, explosive ordnance disposal robot and uh, it's designed to go and uh, go after improvised explosive devices, IEDs. Uh, these have been used extensively in Iraq, Afghanistan, and other locations. And rather than send the uh, individual, an EOD uh, troop with uh, a bomb suit to go down and see what's going on with a pile of trash or whatever target you've seen, we instead send this robot. Next slide. This is a larger version of a uh, armed robot. This is uh, done by a company called Kinetic and it actually is kind of a mini tank and it has a machine gun, it has a laser dazzler, it has a tear gas dispenser, it has a speaker and a microphone system so you can roll this in and basically tell people clear this area or we're gonna engage, uh, engage you. Uh, always a human in the loop, always someone whose finger is on the trigger and controlling when this thing is utilized. Uh, the picture on the right there is a former War College President uh, uh, Admiral Christensen and the day we brought an armed robot to the War College 
took a little finagling to get it through the gate, but uh, it was a, uh, an interesting demonstration for our students. Next slide, please. This is a, uh, the multi-utility tactical transport or the MUT. Uh, again, it's an experimental program. Uh, this is the idea, can you actually take a uh, larger size uh, weapon and mount it on a vehicle that will travel with the troops and uh, go where they go and assist them in what they're doing. Next slide. This is kind of a family of unmanned ground vehicles. Uh, the small one is uh, the throw bot, which is designed to be tossed through a window and give you visibility of what's going on inside that building before you have to, uh, to go in. Uh, again, a, a IED type robot on the right. And then the larger one there is a utility transport approach. What people don't realize, other than the soldiers on this uh, this call is that a uh, modern uh, soldier is asked to go into battle with more weight on his back than the knight in shining armor did. And so if you could offload that material from the back of the individual soldier could uh, make them more effective fighters. So the notion here is you would have this mechanized mule in effect that would carry some of the hardware, some of the ammunition, some of the batteries and other things and again, travel with the dismounted trooper as he goes into battle. So lots of different designs, some with wheels, some with tracks, but uh, all designed for the same purpose and that's to aid in the, uh, the work that the troops have to do. Next slide, please. This is uh, Boston Dynamics. You know, one of the problems is we've all seen so many robots uh, for so many years in the movies, just walking around and doing things like human beings. In fact, that's a very difficult task. And Boston Dynamics has done more than most in terms of developing a humanoid shaped robot that can actually walk alongside or actually do work as a human being would do. On the right hand side are some of their uh, designs for the mechanized mule that we talked about, and then several other designs for humanoid robots. Next slide. This is Atlas, and this is another design by Boston Dynamics. Uh, if you want to go on uh, YouTube and look at this, it's a fascinating piece of video. The uh, robot is, uh, brings this box over. The human being takes it, knocks it out of his hand. The robot picks it up. The human being knocks it out of his hand again. The, human, the robot looks at him like, I rem I'm going to remember you. <laughs> and when the robots take over, you're the guy we're coming after. So it's a uh, humorous uh, video, but it shows the uh, capabilities of the system. Next slide, please. This is a, uh, a Naval War College version of BattleBots, if you will. This is the class that we uh, teach twice a year, Unmanned Systems and Conflict in the 21st Century. And you can see there the, uh, the large scale armed robot. You can see one that I've got my foot on, which is a fascinating ball shaped uh, robot that will swim through the water, swim up on the beach. It has uh, cameras and sensors on either side and those little glass domes. And it is uh, been used by the Marines and uh, by other security operations to basically put it in a uh, storage area and have it roll around and uh, pr patrol for whatever kind of problems might pop up. And the two smaller ones you see there, there's a, another uh, round version of the, the bigger ball and then two of the uh, ground robots uh, that we talked about previously. Next slide. Been a lot of talk of uh, driverless cars. Uh, the photo with the yellow car there is really not what we have in mind where you climb in the back seat and, uh, and let it cruise. However, uh, Tesla, as you can see there in the red car, has developed a driverless car system. It's not a fully driverless car. Tesla says you need to stay engaged. You need to keep your hands on the steering wheel or be ready to grab the steering wheel if necessary, if the system does not function properly. There have been a number of people who've been killed in Teslas uh, they found in many cases it was uh, driver error. 
they, in one case, they were watching a video and uh, the vehicle uh, crashed into a truck. And so it is not ready for prime time, although it is coming. The small white one you see there is something that's more involved with the, like a taxi that would be used on a college campus and whatnot. But driverless cars are potentially in our future. And I think the day will come when you can get in that car and basically say, take me to Chicago and it will be able to do that. But it's not here now. And people need to be very careful of uh, driverless systems. They're really driver assist systems that use a type of artificial intelligence to uh, drive the automobile under human uh, supervision. Next slide. Very briefly, since we talk so much about military systems, I want to touch a couple of uh, touch on a couple of civilian systems. This is uh, called Zipline, and it is a drone that's been used extensively, tens of thousands of flights in Africa, uh, many locations. The infrastructure, the road structure, is is not uh, as good as it could be. Uh, in bad weather, it become they become impassable. Uh, so this is a system that will launch a uh, drone fly it for several hundred miles, get over the target, drop the medicine, whatever might be in the box by parachute. It's recovered by the people on the ground and the drone comes back and is reused. So it is a prime example of uh, drones being used for good. Next slide. This is another design. Uh, there have been uh, uses uh, of uh, drones to fly medical equipment, uh, defibrillators, et cetera, into locations where they're needed. Uh, there have been a number of uh, rescues by uh, drones taking uh, flotation devices off the beach to uh, people who are drowning and uh, saving those lives. Next slide. One of the more interesting applications is precision agriculture. And this is a picture of a drone that's going over a field and uh, using sensors to determine you know, which field, parts of the field potentially are dry and need irrigation, which are infested with, uh, with uh, animal uh, insects, and the drone will then report that back to the farmer. And conceivably, the drone could then come back and spray materials onto the crops. Uh, we have a great need to enhance the ability of uh, crops to feed the hungry, and drones uh, have great uh, potential to help us do that. Next slide. Google, uh, Google Air is uh, looking at ways to be able to deliver packages, as is Amazon. Uh, you know, can you actually fly a drone and drop off a package on your backyard, on your front yard? Uh, it's been done. They've delivered everything from pizza to burritos to medicine. Uh, but the issue is really air traffic control. Do we want hundreds or thousands of these aircraft flying around uh, in areas that are going to have commercial aircraft in them? So a lot of work being done by the FAA to designate certain altitudes for drone use only. And so we think it will come to pass. But uh, uh, still a ways to go on that as well. Next slide. This I love. This is Amazon uh, Prime Air, and this uh, is a uh, pretty wild concept for a basic blimp warehouse that would fly over various locations. Uh, if you decide you want a t-shirt and you're in that stadium, you uh, get on the phone and you order your item, and the drone brings it down and drops it off. Why that's better than going to the store and buying it, I'm not quite sure, but uh, a lot of money is being spent on concepts such as this and uh, uh, the ability to deliver material when and where it's needed uh, in, in new and innovative ways. So next slide. Okay, so we've talked about robots that fly, those that swim and those that crawl. Next slide. The uh, before mentioned uh, One Nation Under Drones. Uh, this is a, a picture taken on top of the Marina Bay Sands in Singapore. And those are indeed my pasty white feet. Uh, but One Nation Under Drones is an interesting book. And uh, if you want to know more about how these systems operate, that's a, a way you can do it. So uh, next slide, please. 
All right, uh, Gary, I think we're ready to take any questions anyone might have. Thanks very much. All right, thanks, uh, Dean, for uh, <clears throat> for bringing us back to um, our Zoom session. Um, so uh, we have one question, and uh, I would encourage um, uh, anybody out there that has like additional questions to please uh, uh, go ahead and type them in the chat uh, in the chat box. Uh, the one question that we do have, and I, I also have a couple of other questions as well, um, are what are your views on the challenge that skeptics state? Uh, with the use of drones, which is its vulnerability to jamming, hacking, and cyber terrorism? Well, that's three, uh, three big questions right there. Uh, I, I think we have to understand that these systems are vulnerable to hacking. Uh, they are vulnerable to jamming. Uh, what you have to do is develop the capability in some cases for these systems to be more autonomous so that you give them a, uh, a task and you're not required to continually provide input as the drone executes that task. The Predator and Rooter, uh, as you may be aware, are hand flown. Uh, there is a pilot in command every second they're in the air. If you jam that signal, the aircraft will return to its home base, but you don't accomplish the mission that you want to accomplish. So if you have an autonomous system and you say, okay, here is your task, go and do it, send back information and return, then you've avoided that need for the, uh, the continuous data link. Uh, hackers absolutely are, are an issue. You can use various systems to, uh, to harden your, uh, your control links so that it's not as easy to hack, but you're always gonna be subject to potentially someone who's able to crack in there and, uh, and do, you, do you ill. Uh, the whole issue of uh, whether or not we should use these, there's a lot of moral and ethical discussions about, you know, do we wanna use these kind of systems? Uh, I think the, uh, the US, Na US Navy, the US government, others, the Air Force, have taken a long, hard look at these and have determined that when properly used, they are systems that provide capabilities that we need to execute our mission and to protect our uh, military personnel. And so I think you will continue to see them, uh, more and more sophisticated versions of them doing uh, a wide range of uh, applications. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, one of my questions um, is, you know, you, you've, you've, you've absolutely demonstrated, you know, that, you know, we are, we are here in the unmanned systems world, right? Um, and, and so if you could talk just a little bit about, you know, how does your course, and, and this is kind of like, you know, uh, why would someone, you know, want to take your course in order to stay up on, you know, kind of like the latest technology of where, DOD is going. And can you talk a little bit about the certificate program as well? Uh, you know, so, you know, you know, what would students uh, be um, expected to accomplish in order to, um, to, to get the certificate up as well? Absolutely. Uh, the course came about because we saw a need for education on this subject. We like to say that when people come into the military, they understand the level of technology that exists. As they get a bit more senior, they understand evolving technology. In the case of unmanned systems, they've kind of dropped in from the top. Uh, people are being asked to use and to uh, manage and to make procurement decisions on systems that they really are not that familiar with. So what we hope our course is able to do is to provide that level of knowledge to our students. And it's very interesting, you know, we have students who are drone pilots who know everything there is to know about flying drones, but they don't know much about the ground systems. We have everyone from uh, uh, the Border Patrol to a large representation of international officers who take the course because of the application these things have in their nations as well. So uh, it's intended to be a baseline course. We will teach during the 10 weeks, we'll teach a maritime session, an aerial session, a ground session, a legal and ethics session. We'll hear from experts in the field, such as P.W. Singer, 
who wrote the book Ghost War, Ghost Fleet, and others. And so the intent is they spend 10 weeks really involved in these systems. When we get back to the situation where in, we're in person, then what we do is we bring those vendors into the college and we allow the students actually hands on with these systems. And Admiral Chatfield has had the opportunity to fly some of these things and, and use some of these things. So uh, it, it's a good, great opportunity to, to get beyond the PowerPoint and to actually put hands on with these. Uh, the course is useful if you wanna uh, go for the, uh, the Emerging Military Technology, Ethics and Emerging Military Technology Certificate Program because it's one of the courses that really applies to what they're doing. So it is uh, usually a, uh, a, a popular course in that it's so timely and so relative to what all of these people are going to be dealing with when they leave the Naval War College. All right. Um, excellent. Yeah, I've seen that uh, it's been very popular and we've covered your graduations um, when you're handing out your certificates. Um, we have a couple more questions that have come in in the chat uh, and thanks very much for submitting those questions. Um, uh, one question came in and, and wanted to talk about, um, you know, so have countries come to terms with drones and have they established the proper um, policies to control these drones for commerce and its users? And I guess, I mean, that, that could be, you know, we could, you know, you know, uh, flip that over and, and talk about the military, you know, policy for like the, the military uses. But uh, this was, this was, you know, kind of focused on the commerce side of the house. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Uh, you know, it, it varies by country, obviously the, uh, in the United States, the FAA has taken a very slow and steady approach toward allowing these systems to operate in the national airspace. And I applaud them for doing that. You know, some of the vendors say, hey, you're tying our hands. You're not allowing us to move as quickly as we want to. But, you know, we all travel in commercial aircraft. And, you know, we've heard stories of these drones making near approaches to aircraft coming in for landings and whatnot. Uh, it is unfortunately only a question of time before one of these things is sucked into the engine of a commercial aircraft with uh, a potential uh, very, very bad effect. So it behooves us to make sure that we move quickly. Uh, there are systems in most of the drones that are imported in the United States or are built in the United States, the small commercial drones that will not allow them to fly into controlled airspace. So the drone will actually detect that it's around a airport and it will not fly into that area. So we need to make sure that those systems are in action at all times to, uh, to protect that. But absolutely, you know, if you have the ability to fly cargo uh, it, without a pilot in the aircraft, you know, it's just a much more cost-effective approach. And there are a number of people, uh, DHL and others who are looking at this uh, to say, can we in fact eliminate the flight crew and can we do this robotically? You know, the fact of the matter is that uh, most of the flying that's done is done robotically, is done automatically. Uh, the pilot is in the front of the airplane in case something goes wrong, but the great uh, potential, the most of the flying is done by the systems at this point. The question is, are we willing to take that next step and say, I'm willing to get in an airplane that does not have a human being in the front of it? Uh, I'm not quite there yet, but uh, the day may come. And and you're exactly right. I mean, you know, <clears throat> we may not realize how much we are already in a drone when we're up in the sky um, already. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Jackson. Um, we, we certainly appreciate your time and, uh, you know, uh, kind of like going through like all of the unmanned systems uh, that, you know, are currently out there and being developed. And uh, I, I am particularly interested in the Echo and the um, submersible, uh, the unmanned sub. That, that looks like so cool. And I'm looking forward to like, you know, seeing that um, develop further and us taking, um, um, you know, uh, taking possession of it and, and seeing how that fits in the overall operational um, um, submarine um, submarine world. But uh, um, thanks uh, so much. And uh, so we are going to uh, take a quick pause for about five minutes, and then we are going to move into the family discussion group.